Okay, guys, let's wrap up um, the PowerPoint on physical evidence. Okay, so one thing we have to talk about in forensic analysis is the role of probability. Okay, now, as a person who, when I was in graduate school, practically um, curled up in a fetal position and cried when I was forced to take statistics for research, um, I am not a math late. Okay, so I want you to un understand what probability is and how we relate it to forensic science, but do not worry. There's not going to be any math problems or test questions that involve math. Okay, so don't be scared. I just, uh, I want to talk about what this is. So probability is simply defined as the frequency of the occurrence of an event. So let's take a really simple event like a coin flip, okay? So let's say we have a quarter and, you know, it's not like a magic quarter that's weighted or something you bought, you know, but that's like a trick coin. It's just a regular quarter, okay? So when we do a coin flip, you have 50% chance of getting heads and a 50% chance of getting tails, okay? So basically a half chance of each. And if those two events are independent, the two probabilities can be multiplied together, okay? So for example, what is the chance of doing two coin flips and getting heads both times? So the best way to think of this is when you do the first coin flip, let's say you get heads, does that first coin flip influence the second coin flip at all, okay? The answer is no. They're two completely independent events. And because of that, we can multiply the probabilities together. So here's 50% or one half of, for the first flip. And then the probability for the second flip getting heads, that's also a half or 50%. So we multiply those together to get a quarter or 25%. Okay, so the key is if two events are independent of each other, you can multiply the probabilities together. So we use this a lot, for example, in DNA analysis, okay? And I'll talk more about this when we get to the, the unit on DNA. But in DNA, we basically look at 13 separate areas of the DNA, and each one of those 13 areas is given a probability and they have purposely, meaning the researchers who developed forensic DNA, have chosen different locations on the DNA that are completely independent of each other. And because of that, we can multiply the probabilities at each one of the 13 locations together. And that's why when you hear about a DNA match, you'll hear about statistics like the, the DNA profile that matched the defendant would be found in one in three trillion white people, one in 2.8 billion black people, and one in four trillion Hispanic people, okay? Because we look at different databases and that number, which far exceeds the population of the earth, um, is the result of multiplying those 13 independent events together. Okay, so when you have probabilities available, if they're independent events, you can multiply them. However, I want to draw your attention to this statement. So with many processes that we look at in the crime lab, and especially in, for example, pattern evidence and tool marks and ballistics, you don't even have math behind it. You can't put probabilities on it because they are so incredibly unique. Things like footwear patterns, um, tire impressions, the striations on a tool mark or the stri striations on a bullet or a cartridge case. There's no way to put mathematical probabilities on those. Okay, so that being said, let me give the definition of two other categories of evidence that I want you to know, okay? So there is what we call class evidence and then there is individual evidence. So individual evidence is evidence that can be associated to a common source with an extremely high degree of probability. 
Um, and individual evidence is usually what you'll see on TV crime shows because it's always the really sexy evidence, okay? Like the DNA or a bullet or a fingerprint, okay? Those are examples of individual characteristics because you can match the fingerprint to a single person. You can match the DNA to a single person. You can match um, the striations on the bullet to a single firearm. So that is what individual evidence is. By far more commonly found is class evidence. So when you have evidence that can only be associated with a group, that is class evidence or said to have class characteristics. And this is the stuff that's not commonly on TV shows. It's considered kind of a non-sexy evidence. Um, things like, okay, yes, this is an oak leaf. Okay, just identify and say the species of a leaf. You can't say that, okay, this is a leaf and it fell from that one tree, but you can at least tell what species it is. That is example of class characteristics. Um, saying that, yes, this is a human head hair, and you can't say that the hair came from that particular person. Okay, that's an example of class characteristics. However, what I wanna get across to you, um, both as maybe future law enforcement or future jurors, is that if you have enough class evidence, it can be every bit as powerful as a single bit of individual evidence, okay? Jurors are always looking for individual evidence, okay? And a lot of times they discount class evidence. I wanna encourage you not to do that. Okay, so like I said, when you can associate evidence with a group and not with a single source, like a single person or a single vehicle or a single gun, that's when it is called class evidence. Okay, so here's a really important statement. By far, class evidence is the most common type of evidence found at crime scenes. So future law enforcement, future CSI, do not discount class evidence, collect it. If you think it's probative, has the potential to be probative to, you know, if, if there's soil at the crime scene, you can potentially find soil that could be linked to that location, maybe in the suspect's tires, um, suspect's shoes. And yeah, you can't link it, you know, to that area within a couple feet, but you can at least link them to that geographical area, okay? That could be class evidence. So keep that in mind when processing crime scenes and jurors, when you're looking at things processed from crime scenes, um, it doesn't mean that it's not important, okay? And if they you collect it, I mean, let's face it, a crime scene, you pretty much have one chance to process it, and then that's it. You can't keep going back again and again and again unlike what they show on TV. Um, so you have one chance to process it. So when in, you know, when in doubt, collect that class evidence. The worst thing that can happen is you won't use it. You don't need to submit it to the lab, but at least you've collected it, okay? So keep this in mind, class evidence, way, way more common than um, individual evidence. And because we live in a mass-produced society. Class evidence is so diverse, right? You have glass, you have soil, you have clothing fibers, you have plant material, you have paint. I mean, all of these different things can fit into a group as opposed to an individual. But if you have enough of those pieces of evidence, it's like building a pile of evidence. So. Yeah, enough class evidence can be every bit as convincing to a jury as one single, you know, DNA result or one single fingerprint. So here are some examples of class evidence. So hair, if we are just looking at it under the microscope, you know, in a comparison microscope. So um, the microscopist could say, oh yeah, this has a similar color, it has a similar width. Um, you know, if it matches under the microscope, could say that the hair from the evidence, um, you know, cannot be excluded as having originated from this source, whatever it is, okay? Also saying that this is blood 
or this is you know, semen or saliva or urine. If you're not doing DNA on it, then it is class evidence. You're just stating what the body fluid is. Okay, also anything in drug chemistry, um, you know, it's not gonna be possible to say, well, this is cocaine and it came from this particular cartel. I mean, maybe you can say that, but it's not gonna be from the drug chemistry evidence. All the drug chemistry evidence will do is say, this is cocaine, this is how much of it there was, and this is the purity. Okay, fibers. Um, you know, you could say that this, these fibers originated from, uh, could have originated from the red sweater owned by the suspect, but you know, there's lots of red sweaters sold. So can you say it is from that particular sweater? No, but you can't exclude that sweater as being the source. Okay, same things with accelerants at arson scenes like gasoline, generic explosives, um, automotive paint or glass. Basically any item that is mass produced, because there's so much of it out there, it's gonna fit into the category of class evidence. Okay, individual evidence. So this is the sexy stuff, right? And it's great when it happens, but it doesn't always. I mean, in my experience, about 10% of cases have usable DNA, and then you may not even have to go to court, okay? The results may not even be probative. So with individual evidence, you may be able to put math on it, like DNA, or you may not be able to because it is simply so individualizing. So think of, for example, footwear patterns, okay? If you go and buy a pair of shoes, there's already some manufacturing marks, okay, that are individualizing on the tread of the shoe, and then no one else is gonna wear that shoe in the exact same way. You have your own unique gait. You go to different places, you know, that no one else is gonna follow that exact same path. You have your own weight distribution. So those shoes, the tread is going to have wear and tear on it that is totally and completely individualizing to the point where you can't put probability or math on it, okay? This is the beauty of pattern evidence, but it's also the problem with pattern evidence because you don't have a lot of math and science that backs it up. It's basically a, a scientist comparing two patterns and saying whether they match or not. So in theory, it's awesome. Um, in you know practicality, if you have someone that's maybe not that well-trained or maybe not that ethical, yeah, you can run into a problem. Okay, so with footwear, tires, still fingerprints, it's basically, it's so individualizing that we can't put any probabilities on it. Okay, DNA we can, fingerprints and pattern evidence we can't. So currently in the courtroom, DNA analysts will still give statistics, okay, and then they let the jury consider that. That may change, I think in your lifetime, it may get to the point where the DNA expert is able to point at the defendant and say, that DNA profile came from that person and no one else on the face of the earth. Okay, we'll wait and see if that happens. And likewise, right now, and I'm teaching you the way it is in the American system, okay, fingerprint analysts can do that. They can point at a defendant and say the fingerprint matches um, the, the person uh, in the defendant's chair and they don't have to give statistics. I will tell you that other countries are actually looking at giving statistics on fingerprints, um, but currently the United States does not do that. So here are some examples of individual evidence. So fingerprints are considered pretty much the best evidence. They're completely individualizing. Um, the striations um, on bullets and cartridge casings or tool marks like the example of the crowbar um, that I showed you in the intro PowerPoint. Um, tire wear impressions, footwear, I discussed that. Tires are the same way. No one has your same vehicle. No one drives the exact same path. Um, so tires are very, very individualizing. Um, handwriting, completely individualizing. Um, <clears throat> any type of evidence where you can fit things together, like um, in a jigsaw puzzle, but you know, the, the crime lab doesn't have time to do things that are like broken into 10,000 pieces, but 
Um, if it's doable and you can see how it fits together perfectly, you know, like say for example, auto lights, maybe that haven't been shattered, but they have just been broken and they can fit back together, maybe from a vehicle and a hit and run, and then some glass shards from the crime scene. Yeah, that could end up being individual evidence if you can fit them together and they fit perfectly like a puzzle. Um, and strangely enough, the shopping bags that you get, say from Hy-Vee or Walmart or Target, um, those are actually made sequentially and have striation marks on them similar to bullets and tool marks. So um, those can be fit together as well. And then of course I've, I've talked about DNA and DNA is the one that you can actually put math on. The rest of these, you know, there's no way to put probability on them. Um, I mean, you can put stuff in a database, but it's basically lining up and see if they share enough characteristics in common. So, the, the take home lesson for this is do not discount class evidence. Many items of class evidence can prove just as compelling to a jury as one item of individual evidence. Okay, and also important is that keep in mind that forensic science isn't always for the courtroom. Um, most cases are plea bargain, so they don't go to trial. Um, and forensic science is most commonly used during the investigative phase. So we are there, there to remember just to prove facts. So can we corroborate a victim story? Can we um, you know, corroborate or discount what a suspect is saying? Um, can we use comparison analysis to exclude suspects, for example, in DNA? Um, so really, the majority of forensic science happens during the investigation. It's not to take that person to court. That just doesn't happen that often. Um, in my time at the lab, I, you know, I did thousands and thousands of DNA comparisons, and I only went to court as an expert witness 35 times. So, you know, it just doesn't happen that often. And also keep this in mind that the ultimate impact of physical evidence, even if it's collected perfectly, there's a perfect chain of custody, it's analyzed really well, you can think that, oh, this is the best evidence in the world. This is a slam dunk. We're going to get a conviction. And then the jury on that given day may say, no, nope, acquittal. And then a different jury on another day would be, oh, yes, conviction. Okay. And a judge, if it's a, it's a bench, bench trial, can act the same way. So my best advice to future law enforcement is to do the best you can do to get evidence admitted into court by collecting it well, following the chain of custody, doing your job, and then you kind of just have to let it go because it's out of your control. Everything is up to the members of the jury or that judge to determine whether, you know, the weight that the evidence is given in the trial. Okay, one final um, slide that I want to show here. Remember, databases are basically repositories of samples from known sources that are analyzed by accepted methods, okay? And it can be images as well. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of databases, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of, uh, of a lot of these. So APHIS or IAFIS is the, you can call it by either name, is the automated fingerprint identification system. So that's where you can upload fingerprints. Um, and they may be fingerprints that you don't know who they belong to, but maybe two cases match. So now you've connected those cases. Now you just need to find out who the person is who left that print. Um, CODIS, we'll talk about in the DNA section, that is the DNA database known as the Combined DNA Index System. There's also a database for ballistics. So here it is looking at striations made on bullets and cartridge casings. And yeah, the beauty of that, kind of like DNA and fingerprints, is you can connect cases. You may not know who owns that gun, but now you know the same gun was used in maybe two or a series of homicides. So you're looking for a single weapon. So there's also a database for automotive paint. 
there is a shoe print image. There's actually a whole bunch of forensic databases that are only accessible by law enforcement and by accredited forensic labs that are available um, for comparisons. So that's the end. Okay, that's the end of physical evidence. Okay, thanks guys.